Last week, I was very privileged to be invited to take part in a podcast discussion hosted by internet entrepreneur and climate communicator Dragos Stefanescu for his You've Been Warmed channel. Dragos has interviewed several leading climate advocates for his podcast, including Roger Hallam, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, and Dr. John Cook, the founder of the Skeptical Science website. So it was an honour to be asked to contribute. You can listen to those discussions and others at www.you'vebeenwarmed.com or by searching You've Been Warmed with an M at all the usual platforms. And you can follow Dragos on Twitter at the address that's showing on your screens right now. My conversation with Dragos follows this, and the podcast is being released simultaneously on the You've Been Warmed website. So, without further ado, let's dive straight into it. A very wise guy, I forget his name now on on the internet, um, said individuals can sometimes think that everything they do is just a drop in the ocean. But of course, the ocean is made up of drops, and that that really that really hit home to me. That that people should that's the biggest message. Don't ever think that stuff you do as an individual has no value or worth because it, it does. Because once everybody starts to coordinate and do the same thing, we become a very powerful force. And throughout history, you can see examples of where people have come together um, to make in collective action to make change in society. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been warmed. It's time to figure out the climate crisis with the top scientists, activists, and entrepreneurs helping us get out of this mess. Now let's welcome your host, Dragos, in three, two, one. Today's You've Been Warmed episode welcomes Dave Borlas, a growing YouTube star when it comes to the climate change conversation. Dave produces videos on his YouTube channel, Just Have a Think, where he educates his over 50,000 subscribers on various topics related to climate change. His content is immensely valuable because he manages to condense heavy amounts of information into medium-sized videos, about 10 to 15 minutes long, which are easily digestible. Not everybody can read scientific papers and synthesize information, and not everybody has the time to research as much. I'm personally a big fan of his channel, having watched a lot of the content and found amazing insights in his videos, for example, detailing the IPCC 1.5 degree report, nuclear technology, or the latest developments in battery tech. It was a pleasure to speak to Dave about his channel and his content creation process. We also dove deep into the individual changes he made to his own life to offset his own emissions, how important social movements are to creating lasting change, the difference between the Western world and developing countries when it comes to climate change, as well as the nuclear versus renewables debate. If you're watching this video published on Dave's YouTube channel, unfortunately, I had some technical difficulties and only managed to record his screen so you won't be able to see me. Hopefully, I learned my lesson for the next video interview that I do. I highly recommend watching or listening to the interview and definitely consider subscribing to Dave's channel and becoming a patron. Supporting high quality content around climate change will help him dedicate more time and educate more people about this crucial topic. All right, let's go straight to our interview. All right, so we are live. I'm here with Dave Borlas. Hey, Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's awesome to talk to you. I mentioned before that um, your YouTube channel was a big inspiration for me, and I I really admired the way you you managed to condense these topics and explain them, and you always provide references, and everything is is very well researched and, and thought of. So I was really excited to get you on the show and kind of dig a bit deeper into, because people can see you, right? Every week you sure. publish a video, but just kind of wanted to go into your thought process behind it, why you're passionate about climate and all that. But first of all, for those that don't know you, um, tell us a bit about your background, how you became interested in climate change and why did you decide to to start a YouTube channel to cover it? Sure. Well, I've got some background in generally practical things. I, 25 years ago, I did a degree with the Open University in the UK in technology. And we studied, we actually studied a lot about materials. Um, but also we looked at one of the case studies back then was the Danish wind, uh, wind power example from the early 70s when we had a fuel crisis over Europe. Um, 
and it was a very good example of how uh, different governments different governments took different stances on new technologies. The UK government, we're the windiest country in Europe. The UK government was offered the opportunity to develop wind power as their alternative source of power from, from oil. Um, but it wasn't a complete and finished and final technology. So the UK government discarded it in favour of North Sea oil and gas, which was a new resource as well. Whereas the Danish government said, OK, this isn't a complete uh, science yet but we've got a lot of farmers and we've got a lot of agricultural land in in Denmark let's just give all our farmers the opportunity to test windmills on their on their farms set up a center of excellence in Copenhagen let them bring all the best ideas to the center and see how it goes and, and that developed into a four billion dollar industry in Denmark they and they're still pretty much ahead of the game today in terms of technology so it just even then 25 years ago it made me think well that's interesting that for far-sighted governments and, tech and corporations can get an advantage if, they, if they're prepared to take a risk at the start. Fast forward to my 48th birthday, which was three years ago, and I wanted to put uh, solar panels. I've got a little cabin in my back garden. I wanted to do a DIY sort of solar installation there just to learn about how it worked because I was curious because I'm a practical sort of a guy. And you go online to find out, you know, you go and find a tutorial and you learn. And of course, you know, we all know what YouTube and, and the internet's like. As soon as you start going and searching, you get branched off into all sorts of yep. areas. And the main one that kept seemed to kept coming up was this problem about Arctic sea ice, um, which, you know, we all vaguely, I, or I vaguely knew about the climate change problem. And I vaguely knew that it, it was something to do with the Arctic but I have to admit, it wasn't much more than that. And so I bought a book uh, called A Farewell to Ice by a guy called Peter Waddams. And he's a professor of oceanography up at Cambridge University in the UK. And actually, I've had the privilege of interviewing him now as part of the, the channel's uh, program output. And that book really was my epiphany. Um, and if you know, I would highly recommend if people have, have, can get hold of it, get hold of a copy. and We'll link it in the show it. notes. Yeah, okay. It's, it's a very, very detailed book. It, it, you, you, the, the first few chapters are extremely technical. You have to read through those because it's technical detail about how these things happen in the Arctic and how the different um, physical um, attributes come together and cause you know, Arctic sea ice loss and what the consequences of that are. And he's been looking at it for 45 years, you know, so he, he's seen it over a long period of time. So he's a real authority on the subject. That made me realise the gravity of the situation and how much of a predicament we're in and how little people are being told about it. And it also made me realise, as I started to read scientific papers that Peter referenced, how complicated the language is that science tends to use to explain, because they're not trying to explain the situation to you and me. They're trying to explain the situation to fellow, fellow scientists. Yeah so that they can get peer recognition, so that their paper can be accepted as, as genuine and bona fide. And that means the language is very technical. So I wanted to create something that enabled me to read and understand that scientific information and then convey it to other people like me, laymen, in a way that's a bit more understandable and maybe a little bit more upbeat and a bit more approachable and in small snippets, 10, 15 minutes, so that you know, you're not asking someone to trawl through an hour, an hour and a half of, of uh, information. So that's kind of where I started. And also for me to, so I thought, well, let's get my own house in order by the time I'm 50. That was a two year project. Talk about it on YouTube as I'm going through week by week. I'm learning, I'll share with you what I'm learning. So you'll notice if, if you watch the, the first few videos, which are really poor quality, but it's more about me picking a subject that I don't know about. Let's find out about this, that and the other. Um, and of course, as time's gone on, it's, it's, it's developed the way to what you see now, which is I've got patrons and people suggesting t subject matter to talk about. And I, I go and research that um, it, it, probably more thoroughly than I, than I did right at the start, because I'm conscious that there's more people I'm talking to now. Um, and the information needs to be more and more accurate every week, really. Yeah. And it gives you energy that that feedback when you know people are watching more and more people are watching, it gives you energy to continue and motivation. And I, I have a similar reason for, what, for what, why I started this podcast, because 
I wanted to learn and I thought, okay, the easiest way would be for me to interview subject matter experts and just ask the questions that I would ask. And naturally, because we're facing a climate crisis and it's becoming more and more mainstream, other people will want to to find out about this as well. And yeah. further to your point, it's funny they mentioned the, the Arctic sea ice. I actually interviewed, it's, it's not yet published, but probably by the time that people watch this, it, it will have been published. I interviewed Zach Labe, who's this, oh, um, yeah. oh yeah. you know him. Oh yeah, he does all the charts. He's the PhD yeah, graph. exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I interviewed him last week, I think, and um, it was funny because the way he got really well known on Twitter is because he produces those graphs, which yeah are quite complicated. You know, it's like quite complicated science, and it's very specific. He only focuses on Arctic sea ice, um, but he makes them in such an interactive way that anyone could understand. And he actually Absolutely. has like an internal challenge of how can I showcase these numbers in a way that people understand, um, you know, what, what I'm talking about, that anyone yeah. can understand. And that's why he became popular. So I think what you're doing by studying the science and scientific journals, which I know can be quite abstract and not, not everyone can do that. Um, and then putting it in video form every week is really, really valuable. And just by watching some of your videos, it, it, you know, I sit down while I eat and I watch a topic and I, I end up being much more informed um, without having to actually go into all the details. Yeah. And that that's really the, the aim. And Zach is a great example, his graphs. And, and again, I would urge people to go and find him because they're, they're very simple. They're on a black background with two or three key colors on a, on a simple graph animated so that you're not just looking at something very stale and dry. You're looking at an animation generally. Um, and and the way he animates those graphs is, is as you say, it's very attractive, very interactive, and very clear. It, it, you know, it's it's very simple and very clear. And so he's a great. And I've used a, a lot of his graphs in in some of my videos as well, too, because they're just so useful to explain a concept. Um, and that exact you've in a nutshell, that's exactly what it's trying to achieve. It's t you're on a train or you're eating or you know you're doing something else, but you just want ten minutes of information to get across a point and. To add that to your list of, of essential broad topics that you now understand about climate change and, and this, there are a lot of them and and it's a very complicated subject and if you can just chip away week by week you know finding something new over time i think people and people have said this to me over time i've watched your programs and i'm starting to get a better broader rounder understanding of of the of how our ecosystems are completely interlinked and how climate change affects every single aspect and you can't do you can't easily do that in one 10 minute program you know there's so much to it so it, it youtube's great because it gives you that opportunity to break it down into just 10 or 15 minute sections once a week or however often you want to publish and people can come in and access it whenever they want and that that's that's the beauty of this sort of broadcast media um that you can't have with traditional television um because they have to work to a schedule so it, everything about youtube works well from my point of view, um, to get a message across bit by bit over time. And and people are using it in education. A lot of teachers contact me and say, we will watch your video for 10 minutes at the start of the 40 minute lesson. And then we will have a discussion for the last half an hour about wow. the points in your video. Yeah, I mean, I'm blown away when people tell me that. I'm like, I am not worthy of that. But they just find it a useful starting point to, to start a conversation in the classroom of, of, of kids. So that's amazing. So uh, it's it's that's all I really wanted. It, uh, my motivation has never been financial. I just of course I just des desperately wanted to. I just felt there was all this information that I just learned about, and I didn't think anyone else knew about it. And I thought I I could help here. I could just do my little bit. I've reached a point in my career where you know I've learned some stuff for myself over life. I'm getting towards fifty, and you you kind of want to do something useful by the time you hit 50 or feel like you've done something useful in life. And this is my useful thing that I think I can do. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's really impressive that people are watching. I think you should actually create, uh, maybe this is something that I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about after, but you should actually create online courses and put them on other platforms as well, like Udemy and other educational platforms. Because if people are using your videos as information in classrooms, it's really valuable what you're doing. And we're all kind of playing a, a role in, you know, the activists like Greta are bringing awareness to the topic and everyone's kind of like filling this gap and that gap. That's and, true. And, yeah, and you know, there's like a niche for, for anyone. 
Yeah. And, and I mean, the beauty of actually this year really is, or oh, since like maybe last October, since I started Patreon and, I've, and more people have, so the people that join me in Patreon are obviously the people that are particularly involved and particularly interested in the subject. They've been fantastic. And of course, a lot of those also are running their own initiatives to try and get climate change communication to the masses as well. And we are starting to gradually communicate together and think about ways where we could collaborate so that we've got a you know a greater a greater message from more and more people i think collective action is one of the key issues and key points of the of the channel um so for me that the next step is probably a website um and that i hope will be a portal for this kind of starting to get this kind of information more organized even just starting with uh, and again this has been suggestions from the viewers writing the script or creating the scripts, let's say converting the scripts into PDF documents with uh, illustrations that can be used as, as uh, visual aids in classrooms and could even be constitute a chapter of a book or something. And that, to your point about the, um, the online education, there are great online education sites already. So I, I, I you know, I think they do a good job, but a resource of information on a website, I think, would be certainly something that it looks like is the is the next logical step in the in the just have a think project for sure. Yeah, and one uh, one last thing that I wanted to add on that is that y you said that you know I, I I don't deserve this. I just started by doing um, <laughs> the the information that that I thought should be out there. Usually, if you set out to start a business and you think about oh how can I make the most amount of money from this. Sure, you might be successful, but oftentimes I find people who are successful are the ones who are literally just passionate about what they're doing and what they're producing. Yeah. And because they're producing value, they end up being super successful. So I don't doubt that the YouTube channel is just a start from you for you. And all the ideas that you suggested are really, really good. And I can see it taking off very easily. Well, thank you. And I hope I hope so. I mean, the, the key the key is to drive, the, the, I suppose there's three things drive, well, to provide insight is number one. Number two is to drive behavioral change because that's essential. And number three is to be relevant to collective action because I, I do, and that comes to some, some points perhaps we'll talk about later, but, but uh, that's, those, those are the three uh, key goals that I've tried to live by when I've been um, writing the scripts and releasing the videos. And that, that's what I'll continue in future. Right. So we spoke about the information part and what you provide as part of your channel. Let's talk about, collective action and uh, individual change? Because those are my next two questions and I think they're okay. really interesting. So the first thing, because you already touched on this, um, I, you can see that a lot of the people that are at the forefront of the climate movement, they lead by example. So for example, Greta and a lot of other scientists famously either completely avoid flying or they try to reduce flying as much as possible. And if you dive down into the actual details, numbers wise, it doesn't really make that big of a dent. It's not significant, but in terms of what it transmits to others, it's very, very important. Now you took the step to to install solar roofs just out of curiosity. Yeah. What other actions have you taken to kind of mitigate your personal emissions? And how easy do you think it is for people to adopt this kind of lifestyle? Because you're you're like a very early adopter when it comes to, to solar panels. It's not like I can call someone now here uh, where I live and just get solar panels installed on my uh -huh. on my building just like that yeah and and you're right and there is a there's a scale of from easy to difficult of, because there's a lot of things you can do as an individual um, and some of them are really easy which I'll talk about and some of them are obviously more complicated and of course more expensive so so not everybody can do all of them and I suppose a key point I would say before I run through I have got some things in mind that I've, I've done which I can share with you but one a very sent a very wise guy i forget his name now on on the internet um said individuals can sometimes think that everything they do is just a drop in the ocean but of course the ocean is made up of drops and, and that that really that really hit home to me that that people should that's the biggest message don't ever think that stuff you do as an individual has no value or worth because it, it does because once everybody starts to coordinate and do the same thing we become a very powerful force and throughout history you can see examples of where people have come together um to make t t in collective action to make change in society um there are obvious ones gandhi and the, you know the um the, the movements in america in the 60s and what have you for, for equality of rights 
So um, to me personally, I, I, uh, I suppose the first thing I did about six years ago, I sold my car um, and started to use public transport. Uh, so I get a, a train to work each day now. Not everybody can do that because some people have families, some people have mobility issues. So again, I recognize that that's not possible for everyone. And again, second point is no one should feel there's a lot of finger pointing and stone throwing in this world. You know, if, if you haven't, you know, you can tell someone you've done one, two, three, four, five things, and then they'll find the sixth thing that you haven't done and go, ah, but you haven't done it. <laughs> I'm like, well, Christ, I'm not, you know, I'm not the Archangel Gabriel. You know, we're human beings and we let, we have to live in the real world. But but that equally, that shouldn't be a reason to do nothing at all. So getting rid of my car for me personally as a single guy was some, something I could do. Uh, I walk to the supermarket to get my food each week. And that's a good thing for me because it keeps me fit and healthy. Um, I moved to a plant-based diet about two years ago. Um, and again, not for everybody, but, uh, and, and I don't suggest that everybody has to suddenly change to a vegan lifestyle. Um, but my motivation was when I started to learn about the mismanagement of land and poor land use across the world, and particularly for the industrial scale, um, livestock farming that goes on, uh, that became clear to me that that was a very, a completely unsustainable state of affairs. And, and uh, as part of that, learning and 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 process i suppose i came to realize that there was no need for any animal to die in order for me to f feed and eat there's no need um plant-based diet is is perfectly sufficient it has all the protein and vitamins vitamin b12 has to be supplemented but that's about the only one um and that, i've been on that diet for two years and it's great i feel healthier uh, i've never felt hungry i've never lacked um something to eat um it's actually been an interesting journey of discovery on different types of foods that I never even knew existed. And then uh, on a more practical level, um, I changed my bank account. I looked at how to divest my money away from the, particularly from the fossil fuel industry, uh, as they are, you know, at least 30% of the problem, if not more. Um, uh, so I changed from HSBC, who are one of the world's leading investors in fossil fuel projects to a bank that's based in Holland called Triodos. And they've never invested in, uh, in fossil fuel based projects or anything else that could be regarded as unethical. They only invest in ethical projects. They do a lot of work in local areas. So where there's a local bank, they all invest in that local area. Um, and in the UK, we have a, a, a bank switch guarantee that's legally enshrined. So when you want to switch banks by law, the bank you're moving away from has to share all their information with the bank that you're moving towards and they have to cooperate and the direct debits have to be changed. It's a really easy process in the United Kingdom. Um, and similarly, I changed my energy supplier from a uh, you know, standard energy supplier that was getting most of its um, power from fossil fuels to a 100% green supplier. Um, again, easy thing in the UK at least. It's an easy thing that can be done in probably 15 minutes. Um, and actually, I ended up saving money, not spending money. So those, those are two things that can be, you know, that can be really easily done and don't cost any money. Writing to your elected representative doesn't cost any money, but they, at least in the UK, if you write to your member of parliament, they have to respond um, to their constituents. That's a kind of obligation that MPs have because they're my representative. If I ask him or her a question, they are obliged to at least respond with an answer. Might not be the answer you want, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but they have to tell you what they're doing. And so then at home, uh, I'm just going to put my glasses on because I've written a couple of things down. Uh, yeah, on the solar, um, include battery storage with the solar because that's, that's part of the future where we have smart um, energy grids. Battery storage in homes is going to be important. I changed, I did the obvious stuff like I changed that. I had a lot of 50 watt uh, halogen lights in my house, changed all those to LED, insulated my home. That did cost some money, but we get a grant for that in the UK, so that was subsidised. Nice. Um, and and then uh, I went to the extreme of, of I collect the grey water from my shower now, and I use that to water my garden in the summer, so I'm cutting down on water use. So none of those things are extravagant, expensive things to do. They're all quite simple. I recognise that not everyone can, lo can lose a car, but, um, but none of those were expensive things to do. 
uh, and relatively straightforward. But if everybody did them in the UK, there's 26 million homes. If all 26 million homes changed their energy supplier to a green energy supplier, we would see a very, very significant shift in the activities of the main power suppliers away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energies like solar and wind. Yeah, unfortunately, the world and the way populations uh, work doesn't really work that way. It's more incremental, which is kind of in, in opposition to the urgency we need to actually combat this. A sure. few points that a few points that you mentioned, which I thought were interesting. Um, the first one was you you went vegan, and you know there's, there's a lot of good alternatives. You have a lot of good nutrients. I've also seen quite a lot of startups that are um, pioneering creating um, meat in the lab. Yeah. So they're actually um, obviously everyone knows Impossible Foods, but there's, there's a lot of other ones as well. And it seems like they're going to be able to create even beef in about three weeks, uh, which replicates the texture, the taste and everything from normal beef. And that's going to happen without killing cows. So hopefully that kind of technology comes comes around and it becomes cheap enough that people buy that and they, you know, we don't slaughter tons of animals anymore. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, going to be, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly pragmatic about the meat thing. I, I, I obviously would rather animals weren't killed, but it's, it's not my main motivation for having changed to that diet. My main motivation is to stop the land use, the profligate use of land. Um, we're killing the soil. Without soil, we won't exist as a species. So it's, that, it really is, if you extrapolate these things, they become existential threats. And the way we're ignoring the nutrients that our soils need to be healthy extrapolated over time becomes an existential threat to our species so it just makes sense to me to stop doing that so but as the particularly to your point about lab grown meats as the developing countries take themselves away from agricultural poverty and into the sort of urban more westernized democratic societies affluent societies that we live in one of the signs of of uh, of more affluence is a greater level of meat eating in the diet. That's that's just kind of accepted in society over, uh, in most countries that you make more money, you, you you can afford to eat meat. If we can if we can get this lab grown meat uh, to a level where it, it can be produced from what it sounds like, produced at the sort of volume that that it sounds like they can do, then that that will I think solve a big problem. It, it's it's getting across the getting it over the societal inertia like with all these new ideas just getting people used to the idea once they do then i think it will play a big role i agree with you very important yeah definitely agree with that and, and technology plays plays a big role in it and you know we can make all these individual changes and it's really good because you you lead by example and a lot of people listen to you and some people uh, some of those people might take the same changes, but at the same time, we're talking about collective action, what we can do to um, influence the turn of events collectively. Uh, I recently interviewed, I know we spoke about it, I spoke to to Roger Hallam, the, one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion, mm -hmm. and we also, everyone knows about Greta Thunberg, Fridays for Future, yeah. the Sunrise Movement in the US, a lot of these initiatives, which are, are making a serious uh dent and, and they put serious pressure on politicians where do you stand on on this debate between individual action so what you're doing and systemic change which is led by a collective and i've seen that you also participated in the extinction rebellion uh movement in london so i would assume you're kind of playing both but i'll let you i'll let you reply to that yeah, I, I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't take part in the protest. I'm not a member of Extinction Rebellion. I went there as an observer, really, more than anything okay. else, because I was, I was fascinated by what they were doing, and and I did manage to make a couple of contacts through the YouTube channel um, with people who were in Extinction Rebellion. So I was able to meet a couple of them during the during the protests, which you'll see on the on the Just Have a Think channel. There's a couple of interviews with people. Um, my view is. Essentially, my view is that we need people like Extinction Rebellion. If you if you think of the the, the normal distribution curve or yeah, what the Americans the call the bell rate. curve, yeah. Um, and obviously, at one end, we've got the fossil fuel companies and the deniers saying there's not there's no problem, or you know, if there's a problem, we'll we'll deal with it in our own way. And then at the other end of the extreme, you've got people like Extinction Rebellion. Everyone else is in the middle, yeah. Pretty much, almost to be honest, asleep, just good people going about their lives just want to go to work do a good job for a good day's pay 
make sure they can pay their bills at the end of the month, make sure they can feed their kids. There's nothing wrong with that. But those people are the people I'm trying to get to because they're unaware of the predicament we're in. They're unaware of how dangerous a situation we exist in as a society. So people like Extinction Rebellion, although they made a nuisance of themselves, that's the point. They, you know, they needed to they needed to make a nuisance of themselves so that normal people who were going about their everyday business sat up and listened, and it worked. Um, and people, some people got very angry with them, and uh, and that's understandable. Um, some people think they're anarchists, and and you know, I suppose to a certain extent, in the in the purest sense of the word, they probably are. Yeah. Um, they're anti-hierarchy, certainly. So, if that, and if that's a definition of anarchy, then that's probably not far off. The point is that they 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 probably won't ever be the main government running the country, but they are agitators who drag the agenda forward. They drag that normal distribution curve forward, so that the masses reach a point where perhaps the extinction rebellion it's, are today. They help shift. Mass, they help shift emphasis. the Overton window. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you have to have people like that. Otherwise, nothing moves. And again, if you look back through history, you have to have people like Gandhi, who was he was a nuisance, massive nuisance to the to the uh, the British Raj in, in in India. But he was a peaceful protester. He just got in the way, and Extinction Rebellion are just getting in the way. Greta's the same. She sat outside the Swedish government with a placard and, and just made a nuisance of herself. And it's under whether or not people agree or disagree with the tactics of these people. It is difficult to disagree with the result that they've achieved in 2019. Greta has stood in front of just about every multinational organization that exists on the planet, including the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. The people from Extinction Rebellion, within two weeks of the occupation of London in April, were sitting in a room with Michael Gove, who was the Environment Secretary at the time for the Conservative Party of the United Kingdom, discussing how the government could implement measures that would go some way towards achieving what Extinction Rebellion wanted. Well, they wouldn't have achieved that if they'd written a letter to their MP. Yeah. So, you know, agree with their tactics or not, you can't disagree with the results. And we need those people. We're running out of time. And those people need to drag all of us forward as quickly as possible. So I'm all for it. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think that as long as it's peaceful and it doesn't infringe on people's liberties, Absolutely. which they Absolutely. make a specific point of, yeah. it's very valuable. And one thing that I try to do, I think it's actually, it absolutely fascinates me, is I've interviewed, I want to interview activists. And obviously I spoke to Roger Hallam, but I also interviewed uh, two African activists. One uh -huh. of them is published, one of them probably will be published by the time that this airs out. Uh, one from Nigeria and one from Kenya. And it's really fascinating to see how they perceive the situation because climate change, we don't really, we don't really, I mean, you and I, we probably see it as a threat and everyone who is educated, but we don't really feel the effects now. Sure. I mean, I live in, in Romania most of the year. And mm. when I was young, we had snow for like three months per year. Now we had snow for like two days this year. And that was yeah. it. It's, it's very warm during winter. So I can see the effects, but it's not like it affects me in the sense that in, in summer, yeah, it's hotter, but it's not to the point where I can't live or I have to migrate move somewhere else yeah. these people in africa they actually have a scarcity of resources caused directly by climate change lake chad in, in nigeria shrunk by 90 percent nine Absolutely. zero since 1960 yeah. which causes a lot of instability instability military conflicts women are disproportionately affected by it and so on but largely they are ignored in international talks they get all these promises but nothing actually gets done. So I think it's interesting. And that's one of the things that I try to do is to give a voice to these people because they need to figure out ways in which they can put pressure not only on their local governments, but also on the international bodies where there's a lot of converging interests and a, a disinterest in tackling climate change, at least in the short term. And they need to make these things heard um, so that people can take action. They do. And, and to, a certain, you know, to a certain extent, we have to accept that we still live in a world that's dominated by the the old the old you know power structure and, and um, which means the Western industrialized nations tend to tend to run the agenda. Um, that is changing, of course. China's a big factor in that, for better or for worse, uh, for better and for worse. Actually, <laughs> China's another whole. We could spend a whole podcast on China, but let's not do that now. Um, they, they they do all some of the greatest things for climate change and some of the worst things all at the same time. So there are real paradox which needs to be fixed. 
but in terms of places like China, uh, uh, Africa <clears throat> and Southeast Asia and places like that, yeah, you're right. They don't get enough of a voice and they are the people that are being directly affected right now. That's for, that's for sure. But as time goes on and actually not that long from now, that those of us in the West will become more and more affected, not just directly, but indirectly. So if we look at, let's say, the Midwest of America in 2019, they were frozen in January and February because of a massive polar vortex collapse. Then when, it, when the temperature warmed up, it started to rain because that part of the, of the hemisphere is going to get you know, a greater proportion of the, um, the higher moisture in the atmosphere, 7% more moisture for every 1%, 1 degree Celsius of, inc of temperature increase, 7% more moisture in the atmosphere. A lot of that's happening across that North American continent. So it rained for months and months and months. And what, that meant that the American farmers couldn't plant their crops. I think they only got like 56% of their crops in um, at the key time of year. And that really affected their harvest. They, they kind of they got away with it and they compensated for it. They've got some, some stores and, and they can buy grain in from, the, from other countries so that the American consumer may not have noticed it this year. But that's a portent of what's coming. So it's not just the, the actual weather and the, the heat and the flooding that you and I experience, even though that is b becoming more and more of a problem in, in Europe and in America. It's the secondary consequences of the most of the world's food and well, certainly the grains anyway, the, the cereal crops that are the staple diet for the world are grown in the equatorial band around the earth. And those are the areas where the extremes of temperature are already causing those existential threats that you've talked about, places like Bangladesh and India and um, across Africa and, and even into, into the Midwest of America. So it won't be many years before all of us are feeling those supply chain problems and it might manifest itself in higher prices or it might manifest itself in empty shelves in the supermarket are lovely particularly in rich western countries where everything is laid out on a plate for as i go to a supermarket i expect everything to be available all the time all year round which is insane yeah and that 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 will not continue uh, for many more years so we're all going to start feeling the different and when when societies start feeling that in their pockets or in their availability or in their lifestyle, then things start to change very, very rapidly when it's the rich controlling societies that start feeling the difference. And I think we're already at that. I think that pivotal tipping point has, has, has arrived, if, if I'm honest. I think it arrived in 2019. And I think the next, the decade between 2020 and 2030 will be monumental it's crucial. In, in a way that, yeah, people, I don't think people understand what's coming. It's going to be a roller coaster decade for sure. Yeah, I, I don't want to go into this topic, but I'll, I'll just add it as a comment. It seems like everything is is kind of congregating, you know, political unrest, a lot of extremism in our society, the young generation, which is completely different to the old generation, generally speaking, in, in what they want in, in so many Western countries. It's just like a big, you can see it even politically in who they vote for. It's just like a big divide. Yeah. So it really feels like the next 10 years are going to be decisive in that respect. Yeah, um, yeah I, wanted to, I wanted to shift a bit to the climate debate, quote unquote. I know we uh -huh. discussed before that it's, it's not an actual mm -hmm. debate and it, and it isn't a debate. Um, I think it's simple to a certain extent because we know what we need to do in order to reduce emissions. The solutions are are quite simple. If I told you, yeah, we just need to reduce emissions, shift to renewables, um, stop eating that much meat, etc. But it's also complex because everyone seems to have varying opinions on the approaches that we should take <clears throat> and how realistic they are and what we can actually do without disturbing the status quo too much. Mm -hmm. What has been from that perspective, because there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. There's a debate between renewables and nuclear. There's a debate on, you know, whether renewables are viable and whether battery power can, can get us there. What has been the most difficult topic for you to, to research and produce a video on? Maybe one of these in, in these areas that are quite contentious. Well, yeah, I mean, technically the most difficult in terms of preparing the, the, um, the programs has been transcribing the IPCC special report that came out in October 18, um, about 1.5 degrees of, of change. That was their thousand page report 
with incredibly technical detail that I, I tried to summarize in, I think I did it in five videos. Um, so that was, and there's a lot of, even in there, there's quite a lot of contentious issues that are that disputed. There's a lot of people in the climate um, community that uh, think that the IPCC um, are not hitting hard enough and not, and are massaging their numbers, not so that, so that people don't get too scared. Um, wow. and they're, un, they're underplaying the risk that we are running into. There's a, there's a big body of opinion um, that feels that way. Very respected scientists like Kevin Anderson. Yeah. Um, who, yeah. He, 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 you know, he's quite critical of the, the, the mechanisms by which the IPCC try to make it look, look, the biggest one they use is negative emissions, which I'm, which we've talked about recently on the, on the Just Have a Think channel, which is that they forecast how we will reduce and keep our temperatures below at least two degrees Celsius and hopefully 1.5. After 2050, most of that is, is, is achieved by negative carbon emissions, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in a greater volume than the amount of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. And those technologies exist on paper at the moment, but they don't exist anywhere on any kind of commercial practical scale. They're coming, but they don't yet exist. So I think that's, that's been the most challenging for me where I've released a video that's, that's talked about potential solutions. A great deal of the commentary in the, in the comment section below the videos is, is, is divided between people who are keen to get those solutions up and running more quickly and, think, and feel that we're going too slowly. And then a lot of people who say those solutions simply won't work because you're not. One of the biggest problems is trying to look at the, issues holistically and 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 understanding that the system the, the the earth is a closed system so whatever you do to change something somewhere on the planet is going to it's a butterfly effect you know it's going to have an effect somewhere else on the planet and if you don't factor all of that in then you might do something that you think is going to be helpful like say cutting down trees in a certain part of the world um uh, sorry growing trees in a certain part of the world let's say to 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 sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But in order to grow those trees, you clear some land that maybe 80% of the year was covered in snow and caused an al a caused reflection, albedo reflection, that was bouncing heat back out into the into space more effectively than the system you've just put in by planting a load of trees that are sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. You know, everything has a knock-on effect. So the, that I suppose it's a more broader answer to the one you were asking, but but that's been the most challenging thing for me is is the feedback from people who whatever you put out as a as a proposed solution gets knocked back uh with lots and lots of problems and 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 it's fine that people do that it's right that they do it actually because we do need to understand what we're doing and we need to make the right decisions about the solutions and and it's it's incredibly complicated um so so yeah i think that's for me, to the debate specifically about nuclear versus renewables, I am quite agnostic about nuclear. Um, I recognise from a realistic point of view that nuclear exists today and the nuclear power that exists today will pay, play a part in providing what they call base load yeah. energy, so a constant, never fluctuating uh, supply of energy so that the lights don't go off while we are transitioning from predominantly fossil fuels to predominantly renewable technologies with battery um, energy storage and perhaps energy storage in hydrogen for a longer term as well. But in the longer term, for me personally, nuclear power isn't necessary because renewables and renewables uh, and sustainable energy is on the exponential part of its curve and the costs are coming down so quickly that there's, there's no real reason to look anywhere else. Yeah, I agree. In the short term, nuclear is probably probably helpful. But I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you probably researched this much more in depth. And most of what I know is from your channel anyway. <laughs> <laughs> God, that sounds scary. <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, I, I haven't I haven't yet interviewed someone who's like really deep into nuclear. I want to do that. But basically, um, I think nuclear as it is right now, the technology is, is not that advanced because for one reason or another, it, it wasn't researched. And, you know, we've seen what are kind of questionable decisions even i came to the conclusion in germany or even japan to 
to shut down nuclear. I understand the fears, but if you look at it rationally and, and the number of people that actually died from radiation, it's not that big. Uh, but there's that fear, and I understand, you know, politicians, they need to get elected, and if they propose nuclear, there's a collective fear in, in the common consciousness of, of people in a country. But um, if we manage to get molten salt reactors and these new technologies, which are cheaper, faster to deploy, um, and even those mini mini nuclear reactors that are like something super big, I, yeah. think, I, I think most people would not be opposed to that if they become commercially viable, because they're presumably safe from everything that I've I've read and, and seen, and they can produce that based on um, energy that we need. Yes, and I, and I don't pretend, pretend to be an expert in the field either, um, other than what I've researched for the for the channel. So, so, and again, there are many, many people far more experienced and learned than me uh, who work in the nuclear industries. Um, you will, you will find, and it would be great if you can find them to interview because it'll be a fascinating interview that I'd like to listen to as well. Um, you will find people who are fiercely defending the nuclear industry um, and the safety record, as you say, um, and the, the, the essentially clean technology, if you can find a way to deal with the waste, that's a big if. Um, and you will equally find people on the other side of the argument who point out a multitude of factors that mean that nuclear is totally untenable and unacceptable for society. So there's a there's a like with all these things, there's a massive chasm of of um, divide between those two points of view. And if you listen to both of them, you find validity in in some or, or most of what each of them says. So you, you know you, you're torn. Yeah, um, that's what and um, which is why I've arrived at a point, a, a slightly more prag I suppose as a project manager by trade, a slightly more pragmatic point of view, which is what do we need to do to get the job done. And the job being climate change mitigation and moving to a more sustainable way of organising our society. That's fundamentally what we're trying to achieve here. And in my opinion, regardless of the rights and wrongs of the technicalities of nuclear as, a, as, a, as an energy provider, it appears to me that it, it may not be required. That's the simple fact of the matter. I just think we can, we can achieve what we need to achieve globally with renewable energy sources solar, wind and hydro, um, and crucially, energy storage with distributed smart grids, by which I mean everybody's got um, a, a smart meter in their home and probably an electric vehicle, most people, an electric vehicle outside their house. An electric vehicle is, a, is an energy storage device with a wheel at each corner. And those devices plug into the smart grid and they give energy back when needed and they take energy out when needed. And those smart grids cross continents and time zones. So when it's sunny in Romania and you're providing energy for the, for the smart grid and it's maybe two hours behind in, in the UK and it's getting dark, some of your energy that you're providing can come across the smart grid and provide energy for me and vice versa when we've got daylight and you haven't. That distribution of energy instantaneously in the same way that the internet is distributed. We're yeah. talking now instantly. And there's absolutely no technical reason why why energy in the form of electrical energy can't be distributed in precisely the same way. Once we achieve, that's a big, it's a big infrastructure task. Of course it is. It's probably a generation's worth of work. But the beauty of it, not only will it provide us with that solution, a global energy provision solution, without having to resort to nuclear power or or chase the dream of nuclear fusion, which is always 30 years away probably always will be and certainly giving us the opportunity to move away from fossil fuels um that uh that distribution um mm. of energy means that countries are, are collaborating um more and more and we start to get more if you like equality across the globe in the way we share and understand how we share our our energy and and, and do it in a sustainable way so that i think is a is a is a big plus for the, for the future. But the other point about it is the jobs that people, the other argument, I suppose, about losing all these, these traditional fuels is the jobs that go with those industries. Um, people have, you know, generations after generation have been coal miners or, you know, oil, oil uh, prospectors or whatever. Those, those skills can be moved easily across and are already moving easily across to the renewable energy sector. Um, it's happening in the United States or all across Europe. So we've got a generation's worth of work to do to build infrastructure 
And we've got a generation's worth of employment that goes alongside that. Yeah, I I can see so many parallels of what you're talking to with at least three of the interviews that I've done so far. So with Joshua Rhodes, he, he specializes in, in energy transmission and he was telling me how complex this infrastructure that you need to build is and how you yeah. have to deploy the smart grids, but how it could work in the end. I also spoke to someone, Mike Kirby from Lumina Solar. They're like a, a local residential solar provider in uh, in Maryland, in the US. Uh-huh. Okay. And he was telling me how solar has evolved over 12 years and what policy decisions basically helped that. And basically he, he described how the smart grid works in practical terms that if you have a surplus of energy, it just goes back to the grid and you actually can earn money from that. So I can see that being expanded internationally. Obviously, you have to build a lot of infrastructure. The thing yeah. that resonates with me the most is um, I spoke to, and again, this is not published, but will be soon, um, a Finnish entrepreneur from Silicon Valley. His name is an investor, y- Yuri Engström. And he, they're like early investors in, in seed startups. And he's connected with uh, Zach Exley, who's one of the founders of Justice Democrats. And so okay. basically the, the organization that helped get AOC elected in, in the States. And their whole idea is that the committed, there's this, um, this um, notion of committed emissions, which we're basically at because all the infrastructure that we have, all the oil and gas, all the c- petrol cars that we have on the roads, they basically have a lifespan, which we will probably use. And we're going to emit all these, uh, all this CO2 in the atmosphere already. Yeah. And that will put us over 1.5 degrees warming, mm-hmm. close to two yeah. already. So yeah. basically their argument is we need a, a level of mobilization similar to World War II, where what happened in the US, where you transform the entire industry, because what you're talking about, which you mentioned is, is, is monumental in terms yeah, of yeah. the infrastructure that needs to be deployed. So they're advocating for that, and they're basically advocating for 100% adoption on new technology. So it's not like, oh, hey, look, we can wait for adoption curves to be like, oh, 2% for electric cars this year, and then it goes to 3%, and then it goes to 4%, at some point it becomes exponential. No, every new car has to be an electric car. Every new electrical appliance, um, you know, has to be be renewable. And that sounds very hard to do like impossible in the system that we live in now and probably maybe maybe you share the same view it needs to be encouraged by politicians to the point that you mentioned the jobs need to be transitioned that's kind of what the idea behind the green new deal in the us is Mm. at least recognizing Mm -hmm. that okay if we want to phase out um coal and oil and gas then we're going to need to provide those people with pay and with jobs in the renewable sector. Absolutely. Because otherwise there's no way this will work. Yeah. And and there's no way, you know, it has to be, it has to be societally fair. Otherwise, why are we doing it in the first place? So so if you, you know, if you if you pull out and look at the, if you like, the helicopter view of, of what the predicament the human species is that we're facing, we we are essentially trying to survive as a species. We're also, if we think about it, trying to save as many other species on the planet that we're also killing in the meantime, because that's 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 on us as well. So if you are only going to survive as a species so that you can simply exist, then we're missing the point. We need to survive and thrive as a species, and we need to continue, in my opinion at least, we need to continue on the evolutionary journey that we are current. We're not the final product by any stretch of the imagination. There's a whole bunch of evolution that the human species could still do, assuming that we survive long enough to do it. Um, and again, you could do a whole podcast on what those things are. I won't tell you. I won't share any of them now. People can make their own minds up about that. But, but uh, just 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 surviving so that we can say we still exist is pointless. So it has to be. People have to have jobs that they find engaging and rewarding. People, human beings, have to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Otherwise they get depressed and morose. And we see it a lot in society today. And again, we, we won't go into it, but you know, you and I, everyone, the listeners all know what we're talking about. People lack direction. They get demotivated. They, they lie in bed longer than they should. They get depressed. And that is a downward spiral. Um, so broadly speaking, human beings need to have something to strive for. That's what we're built to do. Uh, we're built to strive. Um, and that means jobs. And and, it's, and that's respect, self-respect for men and women, 
You know, I have a place in society. I have, I am of value. I am of worth. Sense of purpose. Um, sense of purpose. You know, I have my place in my society, and therefore, there's a reason for me to exist. That's crucial. That's hu- that's basic human stuff, and we can't lose that just because we're we don't like coal or we don't like oil. Those 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 human beings need to be protected. Yeah, fully in agreement with you. I wanted to to ask you one last thing, which I ask every every guest on the show. And I, I think sure. we probably covered this uh, quite in depth already, uh, but I want to ask it just for the structure of the show and kind of to get a kind of like a, let's say, a surface level answer. Okay. So I, I, I ask every guest to rank the following sectors in order of importance. I realize, and a lot of people point out that it's a trick question or they don't agree with the framing, <laughs> uh, which I kind of agree with as well. It is kind of a trick question. But if you can order the following four sectors uh, in order of their importance, or if you don't want to order them, just talk about the interrelations between them. Yes. What are the interdependencies? Because I think that's really interesting as well. Yeah. So politics and policy, uh, then you have society as a whole, collective action versus individual action, businesses and what they can do to combat climate change. And then finally, scientific research and innovation. I think you, you study and research parts of the climate change debate that go into all of these sectors. So kind of what is the interrelationship between them that you see? Okay. So, I mean, I, I think you can come at those four questions from both the points of view, um, interactions and importance. And I, so if, if I was to, I suppose if I was to think about them in terms of importance, let's let's call importance urgency. Let's, let's say those two words are the same. Then I would say that in terms of urgency, then industry, industrial emission reductions, uh, you know, from fossil fuels and, and, um, and also emission reduction from land management. And the third one that very, very rarely gets talked about is concrete in building. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that's that's a massive, it's 8%, 8% I think, percent, of, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. of emissions, which is enormous. So Four in terms times of urgency... the aviation industry. Yeah, yeah. And, and, we, and, and people are asleep to it. Um, but it and, it and there are ways, and again, another podcast maybe, but there are ways of, <laughs> of improving the, the cement um, biochars one, which I'm talking about on, on the Just Ever Think channel very soon. But so industry is number one, as in terms of importance. We have to immediately start changing the emissions that industry is kicking out because they're 30% collectively of the problem. Number two is political change, um, because without political change, you, you know, you don't drive industry, essentially. Um, number three, and this is in terms of urgency, um, so number three is societal change, but that's because societal change tends to go hand in hand with political change. And I think right now we need the politics to lead society a little bit more than society leading politics. Um, cause I think people need to just be given to- almost told that we're going to have to do this, I'm afraid. And, and, you know, the politicians need to place, put in place measures that make it as, as unpainful as possible. So politics needs to lead that. And then number four, really, in terms of urgency, is scientific research. And I, I don't say that to denigrate scientific research because it's it's essential, and we're learning new, crucially important new things every day. But but then again, we know basically the science that we need to know in order to address the problems that exist. The science is there. It's it's been there for fifty years. Um, it's been known about and accepted by the fossil fuel companies for at least thirty years. Um, and so there's no real need to do scientific research into whether we've got a problem. We know we have. So that's so in terms of importance, but but I would also say in terms of a circular feedback loop, it almost flips because it is actually the scientific research that informs the decision making by society and politicians. So in terms of the the, the you, you've got a feedback loop here. It is a circle. So science leads to societal change, societal change leads to political change, and political change leads to changes in business and industry, and business and industry invest more in research and development, that drives the science, the science then informs society and politics, and you get you get yourself a, a virtuous circle instead of a vicious circle. So all of those things are crucial. Um, some of them are more urgent than others, and in terms of the, the cause and effect, uh, you have to look at them from different points of view, if that makes sense. It makes a ton of sense. And it one of the things that I hear reiterated over and over again by everyone that I, almost everyone that I interview, they all say the science is pretty well known. We have everything we need to to get this done. We don't need any silver bullet or any miracle on the scientific side of things. 
Um, yeah, probably we, we, we probably need a, an improvement in battery technology and a few other things on the fringes, but there's nothing stopping us from making the first steps right now. So sure. I definitely I definitely agree with everything that you just said. Yeah. I, I feel like we could talk for like another hour, but I'll keep <laughs> it I'll keep it just within one hour. Uh, okay. and maybe we do this again sometime soon. I think that would be quite interesting. Thank you for your time sure. and uh, I definitely great encourage Thank you. yeah I definitely encourage everyone to check out your channel and become a patron because your channel is absolutely amazing and uh, oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's definitely definitely worth it. So yeah, I'll link I'll link the show notes which I think will be quite extensive um, and uh, and point to some of your videos. Is there anything that you want to transmit to people who are who are listening? No, I suppose I suppose the last thing I would leave people with is is that that essentially I I I hope I hope to present a message of hope. In fact, it's it's not all. A lot of people say it's doom and gloom. I think we can fix the problem. There will be carnage in the next fifty years. There's no. I'm not suggesting it's going to be clover and wonderful, you know, unicorns and and cloudless skies. It's going to be really difficult. But I think we can do it because humans are ingenious. And there's a lot of stuff happening. So we just need to get together and get ourselves organised. So awesome. don't give up hope, folks. Don't give up hope. It can be done. <laughs> it's amazing and on that note we'll we'll probably end it here thanks all for your time all right Dragos, great to speak to you Dragos here again thank you so much for listening to this you've been warmed episode i really hope you enjoyed it as much as i did now you can find all the episodes on our website and it's www.you'vebeenwarmed.com both in audio and written form so you can find the transcriptions on there I'd love for you to reach out to me on Twitter and tell me what your favorite episode has been thus far or if you have any feedback on the episode that you just listened to. My Twitter handle is at DRG Stefanescu. So DRG coming from Dragos, my first name, and then Stefanescu, which is my last name. And finally, if you want to get notified when new episodes are out, subscribe to this podcast and consider dropping a review for us if you enjoy the content. That's all for now. See you soon.